So uh, welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for this webinar today, all about servitization. Um, I'm Emma Wink and I'm the coordination officer for the SET Alliance, which is an initiative by the Basel Agency for Sustainable Energy. Um, I know it's a busy time of year for everyone and we're really grateful uh, that you've taken the time today to be with us. Uh, before we start, I just want to mention a couple of things. Uh, firstly, we'd love for you to introduce yourself in the chat, say hello, let us know where you're connecting from. Um, secondly, if you have comments and questions for the speakers, please could you put these in the chat and we'll bring them into the discussion when we can. Um, and lastly, for everyone to know, this session is being recorded and we're going to be making the content available in the future. Um, I'd just also like to say a big thank you to Hugo Mandicello from the Base Comms team for providing technical assistance today. Um, and now I'm going to hand over to my colleague Dimitris Karamitsos. He is a senior business developer at Base and helping with the Set Alliance, and he will be chairing this session today. So over to you. Many thanks, Emma. Can you hear me? Super. So uh, good morning and good afternoon for those of you connecting from Asia and welcome to this first webinar from a series of upcoming webinars organized by the Global Servitization for Energy Transition Alliance. And let me share my screen quickly. Um, let's see here, share. Can you see my screen? Perfect. It's in full, perfect, yeah. Excellent, so for everyone to know, the Global Servitization for Energy Transition Alliance is a program led by the Basel Agency for Sustainable Energy in partnership with its members and its active steering committee formed by the energy partners, CARE, Oxford, the Aston Business School, Atmosphere, and the Advanced Services Group in the UK to accelerate the mainstreaming of the servitization model across markets, also known as product as a service. So before anything, a few words on the Alliance and its purpose. So the SET Alliance is a group of visionary entities from various countries, which aim to mainstream the application of servitization for the deployment of sustainable, clean and energy efficient solutions to accelerate the path to net zero. The vision of the Alliance is a world where markets are transformed and sustainable energy and climate change solutions are the norm rather than the exception. Now, how do we do this? We do this by deploying uh, specific activities such as capacity building, we deploy innovative actionable financial strategies, and we design new tools that help different stakeholders engage, deploy, and invest in servitization. Now, why do we do this? A few words on this. What you have to know, and here comes a little bit the drama, of course, and uh, many of the people on the call, of course, are aware of this. By 2050, energy usage is predicted to increase by 50% around the world. Now, 90% of mitigations aimed on greenhouse gases can actually be achieved by renewable energy and energy efficiency. And if you look at energy efficiency alone, 35% of our targets to reach the Paris Agreement can be achieved by energy efficiency. Now, this, of course, represents a massive investment requirement. So what we are estimating is around 2.4 trillion annual global investments are needed to stay below 1.5 degrees. However, we see that today we are really short on this and we're deploying less than 600 billion investments. That was the last figure updated, I think, in 2021. Now, why is this happening? Because actually the benefits of, for instance, energy efficiency are economically very tangible. So for instance, if we see here on this graph, typically, especially if you look at cooling equipment, for instance, we have the chance today to have uh, two experts in cooling and refrigeration and refrigeration on the panel. The upfront investment cost of such assets is actually just a fraction of the total life cycle cost of those assets. So typically we see even um, total costs ranging from 60% or 70% of the upfront investment cost on such equipment. However, customers still engage with systems that are not energy efficient. So what we see from data on the AI, if we look at cooling, it's that on general, 
customers engage with systems that are 40 to 60% less energy efficient than the best technologies on the market. Now, why is this happening? I'll very briefly mention it because I think uh, Elin, our next panelist, will cover this very well. Is that first, um, well, you have strong market barriers that slow down adaptation of those technologies. So first you have the higher upfront cost, you have a higher risk perception of those technologies, which typically is also related to operations and technology maintenance and repair. Then you have a lack of trust in those solutions from customers who require a lot of data points to showcase the performance of those technologies. And then also you have customers, of course, who have investment priorities. And last but not least, enterprises lack experience in energy efficiency, but as well, they see a big complexity lately in how different technologies can be integrated together to reach uh, better performance and better impact. So in a nutshell, we a strong solution to tackle all of these barriers is what we see servitization. So as an entity here, uh, BASE, we've been active for the past three years in deploying first servitization inside the cooling space. And that's how also we collaborated very strongly with care and energy partners refrigeration. But we see this model to bring a lot of value to a range of technologies which are related to energy efficiency. So for instance, here you have on the graph, for instance, compressed air, lighting, heating, but as well still today in some markets, solar, which can drastically scale, scale up and within Europe as well, and transport as well. So to keep it very brief, what is servitization? And I imagine many people connecting today already know, it's a shift from selling an asset to selling an output to the customer. So it means that the ownership of the equipment stays with the solution provider, who's also better positioned to run uh, the efficiency of that equipment and to keep improving that um, system as it goes on throughout its life cycle. Very briefly, what do we do within uh, the Alliance, the SET Alliance? We aim to help a variety of stakeholders adopt and mainstream this model. So we do this through four key pillars. One of them is capacity building like we do today the development of tools to enable companies to jump quicker into offering this, this model to their customers, running projects with the stakeholders and raising awareness as well on the value of servitization, which involves as well getting in touch with governments and policymakers in implementing it. So that's to keep it very brief. And I take the opportunity now, uh, without further ado, to introduce our first panelist, uh, which is Elin calling us from Sweden, which is also the co-founder of Cradleneck and the Nordic Circular Hotspot. And just as a, as a brief comment for the audience to know, we will connect today with people from across the world. So we will follow with Dave from CareBase in Singapore, um, Dawi from South Africa, and we will close with Leticia from uh, Switzerland. So Elin, many thanks, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, and let's see, I'm gonna screen share here. Let me know when you see my screen. Can you see this now? Yes, good. All right. Uh, yes, so I'm invited here to talk about uh, a project that we're running. Uh, it's about product as a service in the circular economy. And we're going to talk about also the nine critical challenges and how to fix them. But first, first of all, um, I'm just going to introduce myself a bit. Uh, so my name is Elin Bergman, uh, and I'm not a co-founder of CradleNet, but I've been very much involved uh, the last 10 years or so. Uh, and it's one of the oldest circular economy organizations or networks uh, out there uh, that I know about. Um, we started already in 2009. Uh, we are a, a membership-driven organization, a non-profit, and we try to accelerate it, uh, the transition into a circular economy in Sweden uh, and Nordics and the world. Um, and we try to, of course, help our own members with their own circular transition. We try to influence the government and we really try to do everything we can to accelerate the transition. And in, in order to do so, we also thought that there was a very big importance to start collaborating more over country borders. And this is also why I co-founded the Nordic Circular Hotspot, which I am a co-founder of, uh, a Nordic collaboration platform uh, where we 
uh, have an organization, we have a partnership program, we have a digital platform called the Nordic Circular Arena, and we also have a big event every year, the Nordic Circular Summit, which was just taking place in Stockholm the last uh, week. And if you're interested to see everything that happened there, it's recorded and you can see it afterwards. Uh, and anyway, we have managers, uh, managing partners from all Nordic countries, uh, really trying to push um, the circular uh, circular transition in the Nordics. And this is pictures of all of them. I'm not going to go into detail, but it's also funded by Nordic Innovation. Let me know if you have any questions about this afterwards. All right, but now into today's topic. Um, uh, and like I said, I, I mean, CradleNet, the reason why we are operating is uh, that we really try to accelerate uh, the transition to a circular economy. Uh, in the Nordics, but also the world, of course. So if we do a project, we really want to do something that influences or, or kind of speeds up that transition. And there's still a lot of things we don't know uh, about, uh, about the circular economy and why is some business models working really well and why aren't they uh, not working so well, some of them. And when it comes to product as a service business models, there are still, uh, it's kind of uh, communicated as the big, uh, you know, the, business model that will solve everything. It's the big circular solution. But uh, when you start to talk to companies that tried it, it doesn't always work. So we wanted to find out why isn't it always, you know, why isn't it working sometimes? And how can we make it work? When is it working? So we, together with Stena Recycling, started this project uh, and it's also funded by the European uh, Union uh, Regional Development Fund. Anyway, so a bit about this uh, product. Um, so um, how can we make it work? Why, what's the linear model as we currently have uh, today uh, when there are no business case for actions that preserve the value of products beyond the point of sale where we have really wasteful design at the moment? And how can we go to the circular economy uh, transition where we have value uh, preservation as an inherent part of the business logic where we uh, work restoratively and regenerative by design? So this is the main question. Uh, oh, but first of all, I want to kind of also tell you a bit about the different uh, business models and strategies that are out there when it comes to circular economy. And I, I usually use these uh, kind of this nice little list. Um, and what's still needed is a lot of research. And this is this product is part of that uh, because we still don't really know uh, how to do things. What, what still needs to be done and how can we do it the best way? So this is a part of the project. Uh, but um, one thing that we also should talk about more is refuse um, because uh, in the circular economy, we have a mind shift. It's been in the linear economy. It's about all all have been uh, about selling things as fast as possible, usually of very bad quality. Uh, so when the warranty time is over, you just buy new stuff and then you throw uh, it away and then you just do this in a linear way. Uh, but if we could, as companies say, maybe we don't need to sell this product, or maybe as a buyer, you say, maybe we don't need to buy as much. Uh, that, that's also a very strong, uh, you know, notion or part of the circular economy. We need to regulate more, not only you know, when it comes to policy, but also uh, the need and purchasing. Uh, reduce the amount of uh, purchases and materials that are used. And here is a really good part of PASS, because if you have, um, if you stop buying things and instead utilize uh, them, and as a company, you keep the um, the ownership with you, then you can use the product much more, but then it needs to be really high quality. Uh, redesign is a very big part of this. Uh, redesign not only products, but also services. So if we can have the product as a service business model uh, redesigned if you're selling something today. Repair is also very um, important in the circular economy. Uh, of course, reuse. Uh, again, pass is very good here. Uh, repurpose, another uh, way when you actually find totally different purposes of the things you usually sell uh, or buy, uh, but also regenerate. It's when you do not do less bad, but more good instead. Uh, very uh, important, important part of the bio circular economy. 
uh, also renew. This is about renewable energy uh, and circular economy is based on renewable energy. We can't forget that. So a very important part, but also it's a different way of how we relate to other businesses. So collaboration and uh, uh, yeah, new relationships is super important in the circular economy. And the last thing you should do is, of course, recycle, because recycling is good, but it, usually it kind of um, uh, destroys some of the material and it uses a lot of energy, and we don't want that, of course. And the absolute last thing we should do is to remove things. Uh, right now, we're burning a lot of things, especially here in Sweden. We import garbage from all over the world, uh, especially Europe, uh, where, which we burn her, here to do district heating. Um, but burning things in the circular economy is not uh, the way to go. Uh, but some am uh, amount might be uh, needed to be de detoxified. So we might need to burn some things to get the, those poisonous chemicals out of the system. But that's a, a minimal part of what we should do. So this is a super fast list of, of uh, circular business models and strategies. And you can, uh, there's tons of ways to describe this, but I think this is kind of a good way to go, go into the subject. But now going back to the project um, that we had. Um, so product as a service enables the transition to a circular business model and benefits both businesses and customers. And uh, like I, uh, both Dimitri and I said in the beginning, it's, it's about going from the linear economy and not so much the recycling economy to, to the real uh, resource efficient um, circular economy where we pre preserve the value of the products. Um, yes. And business re reap strategic advantages uh, through the circular economy. We get closer customer relations, recurring revenue streams, improved competitiveness, and so on. And the customers benefit from added value by reduced cost of ownership, increased uh, adaptability, and focus on core activities. Um, so, and what does this mean? Well, in the project that we uh, did we interviewed a lot of uh, companies we did a lot of research writing other uh, reports to see uh, what is the benefits when you, uh, you go over to uh, product as a service business models and uh, if you do the traditional product sales uh, you sell a product once and then you just have one cycle basically uh, but everybody knows how to do that. But in the product as a service business models, you keep the products in use for multiple use cycles, but it's uh, a bit more expensive in the beginning uh, when you invest in this. But then you get reduced life cycle costs as you use the product over and over in more cycles. And uh, we kind of use this um, for uh, life cycles in this project because that was the most common that we could find. Let's see here. Yes. Um, and like I said, despite the potential of past accelerated circular transition, uh, everybody says that this is like the way to go forward. It is a bit problematic and, and it doesn't always work. Um, I mean, it says that it's going to be very much more sustainable than the current business models, but uh, people are used to buying things and owning things, uh, like the picture says, I love my phone, I love my car, and, and they are used to, to doing that. They're not used to doing something else or leasing or renting or so. So how do you shift the behaviors? So this project was to really understand why and what businesses could do to improve the attractiveness and success of PASS. Uh, I mean, everybody is saying this will be the solution to everything, but as we can see, there are a lot of failures. So this is why we really big did this big uh, overview. We made this uh, really thick and uh, a lot of text um, uh, report. Uh, but we also not only wanted to do a report, we wanted to kind of develop a methodology on if, if companies want to try a past business models uh, or, or many past business models, what should they do to make it succeed and what should they do not do to make it not succeed? So this is something we are uh, currently doing. We already launched a report uh, this spring and now we're working on the methodology going forward. But what we found when we did the report was that there uh, were nine uh, key challenges that hinder businesses from transitioning to a product as a service business model. 
And one, it kind of, it's divided into three categories. So it's customer acceptance and customers, they really like ownership. Like I said, they underestimate the co uh, total cost of ownership and transaction cost causes inconvenience. Uh, sec section number two is uh, operational and capability related costs. And uh, I mean, it does increase production cost. There are uh, a big lack of past specific capabilities. We need uh, new competences within the companies. And there's also very immature ecosystems for partnerships. Like we said, the circular economy need to collaborate with other companies. But the third um, and the third sector or um, part is the financial risks because it's ha asset heavy business models uh, also uh, kind of uh, um, uh, gives poor liqui liquidity and also it gives difficulty accessing the capital. So going into more in depth with this, um, it's about customer acceptance uh, that it's difficult when the product as a service, um, uh, when the product as a service challenges uh, the convenient conventional norms of consumption. Uh, and like we said, I mean, they challenges the conventional pur uh, purchases and consumption norms and uh, competes with product uh, ownerships. But still, like we said, uh, customers really like ownership and they underestimate the cost of ownership and the transition, uh, transition costs uh, causes a lot of inconveniences. Like it says, why do I have to go across town to pick up it, pick it up? I just want a car. <laughs> I mean, it's you, you have to do different things that you're not used to, basically. And people are not really prone to do that. Um, and businesses are likely to struggle with operational and capability related costs. I mean, you have to do things differently all the, the way through. Um, so uh, PASS introduces new cost categories, but also requires new type, types of competencies. And uh, last, uh, the intrinsic characteristics of product as a service increases financial risks. And PASS requires large initial investments in assets and also results in distributed revenue streams. So what does this mean? Well, <clears throat> taking appropriate actions, businesses can address uh, these challenges. And it could improve customer acceptance by co-creating offerings, uh, addressing inconveniences, and communicating the total cost of ownership. It can also minimize the operational costs by maximizing product utilization rate, building a dev devoted past team and adjusting um, uh, your KPIs to fit your no business uh, context. And also reduce financial risk by efficiently handling your assets, going for gradual, uh, gra gradual <laughs> implementation and building a solid business case using the right KPIs. So, uh, well, we developed now the four part methodology to support the companies uh, with transitioning. And uh, so we have both work workshop companies where the, we kind of get them to read not only the report we have, but also the methodology that we developed, they can kind of feedback on and test. Uh, we also have some, uh, I think it's four companies now that are kind of our uh, what do you call it like test subjects that are really testing to implement these business models. And if you want to read more about it, you can just use your phone and find the link, or you can just uh, find the link down here. I'm happy to send this to you afterwards as well. Um, but uh, what we also try to do is to give a um, uh, like a, a message to the policymakers <clears throat> what they should do. Sorry, am I over time? <laughs> a, a little bit. But... Yeah, sorry. OK. Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, so f just uh, finalizing, uh, there's so much potential for circular economy and pass. It's never been better than now. And now we're learning so much about uh, the potentials if we just don't fall into the same, uh, yeah, the, the same pits and, and kind of avoid these nine challenges and that we mentioned. So read uh, the report, give us some feedback and we would love to, to uh, yeah, hear what you think about it. And, and uh, that's it for me. Thank you. And sorry, I'm over time. 
No issue. Many thanks, Eileen, and uh, thank you for sharing that super interesting insights. Uh, and I've read the report, and I confirm it's really, really good. So I encourage people uh, to read it. Um, I'll quickly jump to our next presenter, uh, Dave from Singapore. Uh, please, Dave, to, the screen is yours. Hi, can you see my screen? All right, thanks everyone. So greetings from Singapore. Um, I work with a company called Care, which is the cooling as a service provider uh, in Asia based here in Singapore. And I wanted to take 10 minutes just to see if by the end of this, I can give you a view as to whether you think servitization can deliver carbon free buildings. It's a topic that we talk about um, a lot in Asia and across the world. Now, before I can do that, I want to very quickly just define what I mean by carbon free, because that's a very big uh, sort of topic. So I want to make two refinements. Uh, the first is there are two obviously life cycles of a building, uh, also um, stages of a building, sorry, life stages, the construction stage and the operational stage. So I want to confine this to the operational stage of a building. So I'm not talking about the embodied carbon within the construction phase, but just in terms of operations. And what I mean by carbon free operations is that it's powered by 100% renewable energy. So if we can get to the stage where our buildings are powered by 100% renewable energy throughout their operations, that's a pretty good step in the right direction. So before I dive into the content, I just wanna really highlight the importance of asking the right question. Because I think for the last decade, we have been asking the wrong questions. Uh, and by answering those, which can sometimes be, be easy to do, it actually doesn't take us in the right direction. So what is a question that we're asking ourselves generally when we go to these conferences uh, and discuss how to operate carbon-free buildings is very simply, how can I operate a carbon-free building? Uh, and the answer to that question is actually very simple. Uh, depending on where you are in the world, you're gonna get a version of this answer. You first of all have to need, you have to cut your consumption by 50%. And you do that by investing in technology, by hiring experts who can then operate that equipment, by using data, so data collection and using artificial intelligence to, to operate systems and to continuously invest in and maintain those systems. So cut your consumption by 50%. And then for the remaining 50%, use renewables. That's basically the answer. And it has been the answer for the last 10 years. Uh, the problem is I think that's the wrong question. And the question we should be asking is, why don't I operate a carbon-free building? If we know how, then why don't we? Um, and like I say, that the, the nuances will be slightly different depending on where you are in the world, but the answer pretty much is the same. And it's actually very similar to what um, Dimitris, you shared at the beginning of at the opening of this webinar. So the question, why don't I operate a carbon-free building today? Well, the answer is, because in order to do that, you need to cut your consumption by 50% and use renewables for the other 50. It is really hard and capital intensive to continuously invest in new technology. Um, if you are not in the built environment, if your business is using buildings, but your, your business is not within the built environment, then hiring experts that aren't in your core business is a huge cost to you. You also have to manage those experts. Investing in you know, artificial intelligence and, and data capture and sensors and all these things that you have to do is very expensive if, if that's not your business. And continuously maintaining it is difficult as well. So I think that's, that's why we don't do it. And therefore, if you ask this slightly different question, now if I was to ask again, how can I operate a carbon-free building? The answer is very different. And the answer is stop trying. Stop trying to do it yourself as a building owner or as a stakeholder in a building and actually instead join the global migration to as a service. So you are already using as a service throughout your life in your personal life, as well as in your business life. So we are all watching Netflix and YouTube. We're all watching Ted talks. We're all getting our news from CNN and BBC or other providers. We're all listening to Spotify. We communicate with other service products like WeChat in, in this part of the world, or maybe you're using WhatsApp or, or Viber or other things like that. We're all using Uber and Grab. We're all using Facebook and LinkedIn. These are all as a service offerings. But also all of our businesses are using them as well. So software as a service has been around for a long, long time. Data as a service, so all of the, the um, uh, 
Microsoft products, all of the Amazon Web Services products, all of that is as a service. And actually, there are lots of companies in the bricks and mortar world which are also offering as a service. So the two that you can see here, Care is a cooling as a service business, and Sunseep is a business here in, in Asia which offers solar as a service. But I'm sure there are offerings in your part of the world as well. And I just want to dive into two very quick case studies on solar as a service and cooling as a service. So depending on where you are, solar as a service can be given in two ways. Uh, you can have on-site solar, so you can get solar panels on your rooftop, which the provider will invest in, supply, install, and operate. And essentially, you can buy energy from those solar panels at a fixed rate um, or, or however they're charging you. And in Asia, that can cover about 10 to 20% of your energy consumption. Maybe in Europe, it can cover a bit more. But if you can't get all of it from solar panels on your rooftop, you can actually have contracts with offsite solar providers, which can put solar power into the grid. You can buy from the grid for the remaining 80 to 90%. So depending on where you are, you'll have different possibilities available to you. But what does that look like? I mean, that's very easy to say on a slide. Uh, this is INSEAD Business School. Um, and as you can see on the rooftop, they have solar panels. So they signed a contract about four years ago to put solar panels on their rooftop, and that provides about 20% of the energy consumption of that building. Uh, a year and a half ago, they signed another contract to do off-site renewables, and they purchased renewable energy at a fixed fee from an off-site provider. So that campus is 100% run by renewables, and they did it by signing two contracts. They didn't have to invest in any equipment. They didn't have to hire any experts. They didn't have to do anything. All they did was simply sign two contracts and they were 100% run by renewables. Um, and because of the cost of utilities at the moment, actually they're paying less than most other buildings in Singapore for their energy. So they're getting solar energy and it's costing them less. But what that means is now they can focus on much simpler and easier things to implement. So if you go to this campus, they are 100% dedicated to reducing the amount of energy they consume. So everything is solar powered and renewable anyway, but they still want to reduce their consumption. And that helps their business. It improves their profitability. So if you go to this campus, as an example, uh, they have executive education and they have a hotel which has four floors. And instead of putting people throughout the different floors somewhat randomly or putting people on higher floors because the views are better, they put people, they do things very simple. They put they fill the first floor and then the second floor and then the third floor and then the fourth floor. So what does that do? It means that if they only have 75% occupancy, they can turn off the air conditioning for the fourth floor. A really simple solution. It also means the lifts don't have to go from the first floor to the fourth floor. They just go from the first to the third. So they save lift energy as well. But they also provide a better experience to their customers because the waiting times for lifts also decreases. So you can see how now as a business, they can focus on far simpler solutions, which are much easier to implement uh, than, you know, looking at how they can invest in technology, hire experts and use data and things like that to reduce their consumption. Uh, they've also signed a cooling as a service contract, um, which I'll come to in a bit later. So they're providing their cooling to the, the campus in the most sustainable way. So the energy consumption is lower. So now they can use these renewables to deliver that um, requirement. Um, if I look at cooling as a service, I'm not gonna go into too much detail because I think Darby might touch on a bit more detail, uh, but essentially it's very similar to solar as a service where the service provider is investing in and owning the cooling system and all of the operational costs required to deliver that cooling. So investing in the chillers and cooling towers and pumps, uh, operating those service and maintenance repairs and utilities. So everything to do with producing the cooling. And then the building owner on the right-hand side simply pays as they use. So very similar to the way that you, you would buy electricity for your building. But what you can see is all of the reasons why we don't have carbon-free buildings today is on the left side of the slide. It's no longer the re responsibility of the building owner. It's now the responsibility of the CAS provider to invest in technology, hire experts, use data and maintain those systems and provide them um, by renewables. But the thing is that's the business of the service provider. So actually you're moving something that was a cost center for the building owners, you're moving it over to a profit center for the, for the providers. And there's huge incentives for investing in new technology, the circular economy and circular design thinking when you do that and when you make that shift. It's a very, very simple shift, but it changes the whole dynamic between your customer and, uh, and your provider. So what does that look like? So this is a, a complex in India, in Pune. Um, it's got automotive 
uh, an automotive factory, which is the large building on the top right. It's got a school. It's got grade A offices um, throughout the precinct. That is provided by cooling as a service, which uses solar as a service. So the solar as a service provides the cooling as a service with energy. It is 100% run on solar energy and actually water capture on site as well. So again, another example of by signing a contract with a solar as a service provider and signing a contract with the cooling as a service provider, they are 100% renewable as well. So what does that look like? So one of the comments made earlier was, you know, the, the companies need to now invest in technology and systems for providing product as a service, as opposed to selling the products. So what these guys did was they, they signed two contracts and they downloaded an app. That was all they did. So now they can see what their consumption is, how their cooling systems are operating, how comfortable their tenants are. Um, some of our, our customers are mission critical. So automotive factories, they have sort of mission critical cooling requirements. So they can see the exact conditions in those spaces from their, from their mobile phone. But I think I, I, can't, I can't state how simple that was. They signed a contract and downloaded an app. And now they're running on 100% renewables. So I think that's, I mean, the, the key message for me really is servitization allows you to choose your vendors based on the sustainability metrics that they're providing, and it allows you to outsource all that hassle. And I think as, as built environment professionals, we need, to stop, we need to stop being worried by saying, it's just too hard to do ourselves. Um, and servitization for me is, is the answer to that, which is if it's too hard to do it yourself, give it to someone else whose business it is. And you see in all other industries as well, so you think about the airline industry. So Singapore Airlines, we use all the time. Singapore Airlines don't make engines and they, and they don't build planes. They, there are other companies which make the engines and build the planes. And they can go and say, go to the market and say, okay, who can give me the most fuel efficient engine? Is it Pratt & Whitney? Is it Rolls-Royce? And they can select their vendors based on their sustainability metrics and their profitability metrics. They don't do it themselves. So yeah, that's my message. Anyone in the built environment, please don't try and do it yourself. Please try and, and work with a, an as-a-service uh, provider. Thank you. Many thanks, Dave, for sharing those insights on how um, we can accelerate the decarbonization of buildings. Um, super, super interesting. Um, I take the opportunity to quickly follow up with uh, Dawi. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, let me share my screen. <clears throat> Okay, there we go. Um, yeah, that was um, a very nice uh, setup for me to, to talk from uh, Aaron and, and Dave. Um, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about a project that we did in the industrial sector and, and really want to emphasize this is not only building as a service or servitization is not only applicable to buildings and commercial uh, institutions institutions but also very applicable in the industrial sector so so i'm really going to focus on a specific project um and uh i think it's going to start off with just to to describe a little bit about energy partners um we are in fact an investor business um we, we slightly different in the sense that we started off with the uh, as a business with the intention of being an investor not the intention of being a, so a, a provider of products uh, and the energy sector in South Africa, you know, uh, at the time, 10 years ago, we went through another electricity crisis and, and it was really just an opportune time um, to look at the energy sector. And the three things we identified was electricity supply, solar PV, um, heating systems, uh, basically boilers and cooling systems in the refrigeration. And we deliver those. Uh, in on a servitization model. And I think really important to, to understand that these things also support one another. Um, like David said, you know, solar power, and we also use that uh, to supply energy to refrigeration systems and waste heat from cooling systems going into heating systems, etc. And that's all brought together by energy intelligence. And I think this is a really important part of servitization is the availability of data and, and our ability now to use uh, big data and AI to, to provide um, useful um, action that we can take um, to ensure these assets perform the way they should. So we uh, started working with Clover in uh, just before 
the pandemic in, in 2019. And they're the, the biggest dairy uh, processor in South Africa. Um, they're over 100 years old, um, and they needed to upgrade the factory in, in close to Durban in South Africa, um, where they produce a variety of products. And it, it, it's quite a big facility. You can see 10 megawatts of, of um, cooling load at 75 tons an hour of, of 30 bar steam. And, and the total electricity needs is, exceeds 10 megawatts. Um, so the process we went through was to, to start off creating a baseline. And, and we used the climate check system um, initially to determine what is the actual efficiency of the refrigeration systems. We built a digital twin, got all the historical electrical data, which luckily they had, and we could then determine what what was their current status, and then did a design with efficiency in mind, and really looked at natural refrigerants, ammonia, um, look at how do we optimize a design, a three-stage system to provide chilled water, glycol, and frozen uh, capability for the butter, um, but include into that, you know, utilizing the high-quality waste heat uh, and provide hot water for 55 degrees C um, to the to the boiler feed uh, water, and also added a two megawatt peak um, solar PV system. Uh, the next step, obviously, is then to to um, uh, design uh, the techno economic model so that we can come up with a tariff. Uh, really, the tariff is is, is what encapsulates the, the the life cycle cost, and I'll get to that now for the customer going forward. And this is a guaranteed life cycle cost because the tariff is fixed for 20 years based on, on what the cost of electricity is. Um, and we needed to obtain the funding. It was about $10 million just for the refrigeration side of things. And, and then built this facility while they're operating in an existing plant room. It was really a tough project for us. Um, they never stopped in the, the process at all. and um, and now using the, the data to drive um, really the, the operation of this project going forward. So you've seen this picture um, earlier from, from uh, Demetrius, uh, total life cycle cost, you know, typically in the system is around about 65% uh, of the life cycle cost of electricity, 20% um, CapEx, 15% maintenance in this scenario, and, and really, their service provider's focus was on uh, plant uptime and temperature management. And as soon as you are, are focusing on those two things, efficiency go out the door. Um, so they, there's no real measurement and no real um, uh, incentive to look at efficiency. And what we did with cooling as a service, of course, is that the focus is now shifts from uptime and temperature management. Not that those are not important, but really focus on efficiency and, and really trying to make the pie smaller. You can now see you we achieve um, a 40% total life cycle cost reduction uh, for them. Uh, although your CapEx component is a little higher, um, you'll see that your total energy cost is, is lower. So this is really where the secret lies. Um, yeah, so servitization really means we take on that risk and, and the customer now doesn't have to, to worry about efficiency. I'm going to give you some headlines of that project. Um, there was a 40% increase in efficiency. I mean, not all projects have got that these kind of nice values, but the, the plant was really uh, not in a good state. Um, and, and the measurements have, have shown that that we are, were in fact able to, to create that, or to give them that 40% um, increase in efficiency, which we modeled up front. Um, we, we're getting about 700 kilowatts of continuous heat into the boiler feed water, which reduces the amount of coal that they need to burn. Um, that's about a 5.5% recovery. Now, there's a lot more heat to, to be recovered in a refrigeration system if we add heat pumps in the future. One can actually take a larger portion of the waste heat and, and, and inject that back into the uh, process. Um, and that could be a next step for us to look at. Um, and then, of course, uh, we're getting 
about 16% of the electricity from the solar PV system, and it's at a significantly less cost than, than current, because it costs about 60%. Um, yeah, so in total, this, this project uh, will save about 132 million kilograms of CO2 emissions over its 20-year life cycle cost. Um, uh, that's equivalent to taking 1,400 cars off the road. Um, and you can see there I've broken it up a little bit. 22 million kilograms comes from the, the avoiding um, coal burn and another 42 million kilo, kilograms from the solar PV system. And just an example of, of how data can be used and what we show our customers as well. You know, um, and, and you can see the confirmation there that that since inception, you know, we've saved them about 40% uh, on electricity. There's the carbon avoidance, the solar generation so is sitting around 16.8% on average. And interestingly enough, in the summer months in, in, in Durban, we're getting less electricity than in the winter months, simply because uh, they've got a lot more cloud in, in, in summer months. Uh, I've just got a few pictures um, to show you. I mean, this is really not a small plant. There's seven big screw compressors standing there in, in that uh, plant room of theirs. Um, it, it's, it was built in an existing plant room. Uh, and you can see, I mean, we didn't, we didn't try and, and, and start a completely new uh, plant room, but eventually ended up with a brand new system. There's, there's nothing left of the old system. We replaced it part by part. Um, Really nice looking looking plant, and um, yeah, last uh, picture in terms of the condensers on the outside. It's a it's a complicated um, uh, installation. That's it from me. Super many thanks, Tawi. And two points that I take out, um, which are extremely relevant. Um, the first one is how this this approach also incentivizes um, to measure the right data. And uh, that's actually a very interesting point also to, the, to our next presenter, Leticia, on looking how those projects are actually bankable uh, and what impact do they bring. And then the second aspect is, I think it's, it's also relevant for Switzerland and across the globe, a lot of buildings and uh, businesses have old assets. And right now they're in a situation where they're short on revenues. And uh, I think servitization there brings a very strong value on the table for them to retrofit and to do fit into their climate targets while not, let's say, uh, further hurting their, their balance sheets. Um, so many, many thanks, uh, Dawi, for those insights. And uh, take the opportunity to um, ask Leticia uh, to, to share her screen. Many thanks, Leticia. Many thanks, Dimitris. Let me share my screen quickly. And let me know if you can see it as well. Perfect. So as, uh, as Dimitris mentioned, yes, let's, let's look at how these type of projects can be bankable. And to do so, maybe I will just quickly introduce you um, Suzy Partners. Um, Suzy, I think, however, I cannot really move my screen. Apologies for that. Let me try again. Yes, apologies for that. Now we're all set. So what I was uh, mentioning before, Suzy. Suzy Partners, uh, it's a um, Swiss asset manager uh, with about uh, 1.7 billion of asset under management as of today. And we are focused on financing the, the energy transition through two platforms, equity and debt. Our investment strategy um, is focused on opportunities across the entire energy transition spectrum, including, for example, green energy generation, energy efficiency measures, as well as, for example, solutions which enables clean energy use. 
And um, we have a focus on uh, uh, OECD countries as geographic scope. And uh, um, as you can see, we have uh, uh, already uh, invested uh, several funds and uh, we always have new, one, uh, new ones coming up. Uh, at the moment, we are investing throughout uh, two funds. One, uh, it's, uh, this is the energy transition strategy, is focused on OECD countries and offer uh, equity solutions um, with, a, with a current size of about uh, 440 million. And then we also have uh, a specific, uh, let's say, Asia dedicated fund, uh, which has a current size of around 80 uh, million US dollars, and it's investing in all Southeast Asian um, countries. And from the credit side, we, um, we have been uh, uh, investing uh, over the past uh, seven years, um, two funds, which uh, are now almost fully invested and we're already fundraising for a third one. But maybe specifically uh, focusing on energy efficiency and the topic of uh, today's webinar, from a financing perspective, there are, uh, let's say some key uh, issues with energy efficiency projects usually. So there is a high granularity um, of the transactions in the market with uh, um, a comparatively small financing uh, ticket size. There is high complexities, you know, due to many stakeholders um, involved, for example, real estate owners, uh, building owners, uh, energy service company, technology provider, and of course, financial institutions. And all of these combined basically um, lead to a low level of standardization of the underlying project contracts. And then, you know, these obstacles um, kind of create a vicious circle because then they make this project difficult to finance from a certain point of view. Um, and therefore, they do not become a priority for company management. And this does not really foster. Uh, growth in the energy efficiency market. However, uh, lately, especially due to the to the energy crisis and the rising uh, uh, the rising energy prices, of course, energy efficiency has become even more key in order to reduce um, cost for all of the shareholders. So, how is it possible that we have invested uh, in energy efficiency projects for the past seven years? Uh, when I just listed all of the obstacles that the financier can face in this environment. Basically, what we did is that we found a way to finance such projects, um, mostly uh, with an underlying uh, energy as a service uh, model, as we're discussing today. And we made them scalable through facilities and framework agreements uh, um, made together with the technology partners and energy efficient and, and energy service companies. So what we use and what we have applied so far is this uh, tripartite structure that you can see on the screen, uh, whereby every counterparty uh, bears a specific risk. So um, what we do is that we finance up to 100% of the CAPEX, which is needed for, for the implementation of the project and we bear the credit risk of the end client, meaning uh, the risk that said client would default on its payments. The energy service companies or developers um, install the measures, the energy efficiency measures um, at the location of the end customers, and uh, they're basically responsible for um, operation and maintenance, as well as installation, and they could do this directly or outsourcing it to, to third parties. And what they bear in this case is the technology risk. So um, the risk that uh, the install measure will, will underperform due to technical issue. And this will definitely then lead to a non-payment of, of um, uh, the end client. Then last but not least, the end client basically uh, as, as Dave mentioned before, would uh, switch from uh, a, an asset heavy business to an asset uh, light business and would basically uh, not bear the capex, but uh, see an opex on, on, on its balance sheet. So in this case, what they bear is the commercial risk, meaning production volumes, 
and this can always um, or usually also be shared with uh, with other parties. So this model basically brought us from uh, uh, 2015 when we started investing our first fund um, and, and it seemed very challenging because of the market fragmentation and, and tough regulatory frameworks um, throughout, throughout Europe to today when we basically invested uh, um, 235 million with our first fund uh, and uh, we raised an additional 289 million for our second uh, follow-up fund uh, of which more than 100% has been already invested. And again, to go back to uh, today's presentation, as you can see here, solar self-consumption, so solar as a service, is uh, representing 27% of our investments at the moment. So we see that um, this type of technology is really uh, picking up uh, a lot uh, lately. Um, in these seven years, we invested across European countries with both public sector entities and corporate clients. And uh, as you can also see from the chart here, um, we have invested in almost every type, I would say, of energy efficiency technology out there. Um, how we did this as well, we basically um, set up several uh, framework agreements with renowned technology partners. One example is the lighting as a service uh, agreement that we have signed with uh, Signify of up to uh, 70 million, uh, whereby basically single transactions are automatically eligible for financing if certain pre-agreed conditions and, and parameters are fulfilled. And this is uh, uh, it for now. As you can see, there are ways in which we can uh, uh, find, uh, uh, find a solution and especially provide financing to really foster the energy transition as well as the wider adoption of the servitization model. Many thanks, Leticia. Um, quick comment, I see on timing we'll, we'll reaching end of the session so we have we have two minutes left however um we can extend just a few minutes and um i have confirmation from the panelists that they have a few more minutes which is great many thanks for that um i'll jump just maybe on one question for each um and then we'll we'll wrap up the webinar um so let's let's continue with the first question directly to you um, leticia and what I have here is um, what can be improved to make such projects and more generally the servitization business model more attractive and bankable? Yeah, thank you, Dimitris. Um, I mean, projects um, like this can become more attractive when, for example, include take or pay clauses, whereby you always have a sort of a fixed floor um, that, uh, that ensures constant payments to to a financing institution, uh, other things that could make it uh, easier um, to finance a project uh, like the ones we have discussed so far are, for example, security packages uh, in REM rights uh, with the assets, as well as, um, most importantly, I would say, standardized contracts in place. So clearly, we tend to think that um, we need to uh, customize all of the project contracts a lot because there are different technologies and different type of uh, needs for our customers. However, in the end, uh, especially with the servitization model, so offering a product or a service um, as a service, it's really easy to have a standard template uh, with just a couple of different clauses, and this really makes a difference. Super, many thanks, Leticia. And I jump on the question of, uh... I'm sorry, I cannot pronounce your name. It's probably uh, connected multiple names together, but from uh, Job. So it's for Ellen and the others. Um, he's asking, during your research, did you find any significant differences in the uptake of product as a service models across countries? For example, are some countries culturally more inclined to scale servitization as a model? If so, why? If I may have missed it. So 
Elin. Should I answer? Yeah. Uh, well, actually, our project wasn't so much uh, looking at other countries. We did uh, look at some uh, some um, examples uh, from abroad. Mostly, we focused on Sweden. But I think in Sweden, at least, uh, we know that our we are a very trendy and rich country. So we are very um, we have all the possibilities to really try things fast. And, and also a very good support system from the government it's easy to, to start new companies and so on. Um, so maybe I don't know if that's cultural, but uh, maybe it is. Um, so I'm not really sure that I'm answering uh, your question so, so well. Maybe someone else uh, has a better view than I do. Please, Dave. Uh, so throughout Asia, I think I would agree, we didn't really see many cultural differences. But if the governments of individual countries are very supportive in terms of financing, funding grants to help businesses uh, become more efficient, where that's where that's available, then I think your, your customer base is lower because they have other solutions they can look at. If you go to countries where they don't have funding, then as a service can be seen as a capital model, um, a CapEx zero model to, to become energy efficient. Um, and it makes the business case for it, which they might not be able to make on their own. So I think that that's the biggest difference we've seen. Many thanks. And maybe David, if you want to add anything on your side. <clears throat> well, I mean, yeah, if you just look at where pooling as a service is, is, is popular at this point in time, you know, it's not really in Europe or the USA. Um, so it, it seems that as a service model is, is adapts, the adapt or the adoption um, takes place, you know, in, in places like Africa and, and Asia um, and Brazil. Um, easier for, for some kind of reason. And I, I assume that's because people are looking for solutions to, to jump across this technology divide. You know, Europeans are, are leading ahead and, and, and we in the developing world are trying to not make the same mistakes. And, and probably that's a message for us to, to jump across to, to, to better technology quicker. Hey, thanks, Dewey. And Leticia, do you want to add anything on your side? Well, I mean, we have uh, uh, invested in projects across the world, I would say, from the US uh, to, to Australia. And I have to say that we didn't really see much difference in the uptake of this type of uh, um, model throughout different uh, geographies. I think it's mostly a question of, uh, um, of, of the customer acceptance, as Eline put it. So it really depends. Uh, mostly on the customers itself instead of uh, the, the geographic frame of where they're located. Many thanks. Mm -hmm. um, and I see here um, a follow-up question from Deepak who mentions through these as a services, we are definitely decreasing carbon footprint. Is there a way to calculate that? So maybe that's also a question directed to Dewi and, and Dave. To the, to the whole panel after. Uh, well, I, well I, I think, you know, it's such an important part. You know, yes, we, we do. We do calculate it. And, and as I've shown, I mean, it's actually measured um, pretty, uh, I would say, accurately in, in, in the systems that we, that we put in because our customers demand that information. It, it's becoming more important, you know, in the sense that, that this is something they have to report on. Um, so yes, we measure it, uh, and, and hopefully very accurately. Right, thanks, Dewi. Anybody want to add an aspect? Yeah, I mean, just adding on that, uh, basically from our fund mandate, we could invest in such projects only if there is a certified uh, um, reduction in CO2 emissions. So we have seen uh, this type of uh, computation throughout every single energy efficiency technology out there. Uh, otherwise, we could not finance those type of projects. So I, I can definitely answer in a positive way to the question. Yes, there are ways to, fi to find out how much CO2 emissions is saved by every technology out there. Yeah, that's great. Many thanks for that. And then we'll, we'll take one last question from uh, Jacques Duprez, um, who's asking, are there any insurers actively providing guarantees for cooling as a service or efficiency as a service contracts? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I'm jumping in here, but yeah, um, 
we we uh, using insurers locally here in South Africa, um, and and it's a it's a part of the offering that we do because we we guarantee our customers almost an extended warranty if you want to call it that for for the time project um, uh, time the period of the project. So so yes, I don't think it's a problem to find that generally. Uh, I don't know. Dave can also maybe comment. Uh, you also using insurers, I assume. Yeah, I, I think once you get to a certain scale, it's similar to, to finding financing, then you, you sort of get interest of insurers um, and investors at the same time. So I think what we did is we sort of took on project by project at the beginning. We then moved to bundling those projects and then offering them out as bundles to investors or, or insurance companies. So I think that's where you, you can get essentially very good service. And they're very interested because everyone's looking to invest in and, and work with sustainable um, revenue streams, so annuity business, but also sustainable um, uh, metrics as well. Super. Um, many thanks to all of you. I'm, I'm looking at the time. We're already seven minutes uh, over time. Uh, so I think we will, not, we will need to wrap up. But uh, with this, I would like to share first a warm thank you to our panelists, Ellen Bergman, Dave McInnes, Leticia Coradeci, and Davi Creel. Many thanks for having shared your insights today with us. It has been a pleasure. For the audience to know, I know that this session was a little bit packed, but it was giving, um, let's say, a high level uh, description of the work that is being done uh, across geographies on servitization. And we will definitely have follow-up webinars where we'll be diving into specific aspects. Um, so looking forward to, uh, to sharing more information on this. And uh, from my side as well, many, many thanks. And um, I'll leave uh, the word to Emma to close the session. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Demetrius, um, for closing the session. If anyone uh, wants to get in touch with the, us at the Set Alliance, you can email me or inf uh, info at setalliance.org. We'd love to hear from you. And if you have any comments um, on topics or suggestions for webinars, we're always looking for how we can create content that's relevant. So. Thanks again to everyone for being here today.